more than anything else tonight, I swear to you that if you take on board what I'm saying and practice these simple techniques, I swear to you that your life will change for the best. You know, because there's such a lot happening globally now, mm. you know, and there's more and more people suffering from mental anguish and emotional disturbance and stuff like that. You know, uh, and suicidal ideation. And so the techniques that I'm going to show you, going to show you tonight is they'll be able to unhook you from all that emotional tension, to think more clearly and to make better decisions. It really is that simple. But because we live in such a westernised mind now, we're always searching too far outwards for solutions, really. And the, the thing tonight is, I've become like Buddha now. You know, <laughs> the most important thing is that it's just become aware of your breathing. You know, that's mm. it, really. Mm. Because if you become aware of your breathing, you've got more chance of understanding what your body's trying to communicate with you. And then you can change your behaviour before it manifests into some all or non-response thing. So, you know, and the neurosciences, I'll say, by all means, butt in and say, Joe, you know, what are you going on about? Because, you, you know, you're becoming too technical. I don't mind. Because yeah. I'm from Seacom, so I can do like, um, <laughs> you know, I can do slang. Out of here, they call me Dr. F in Joe, but uh, I'm going to try and, you know, I'm going to try and sort of behave myself tonight if it's all possible. But I'll do my best. But as for political correctness, I, I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Whatever you do, Please don't believe a single word I say tonight. No, honestly, honestly, don't believe, don't believe anything unless it sits right with you and it feels true for you at a mm. deep level. Because I mean, there's such a lot of blag, you know, going on uh, that people are misinterpreting things. That this is my experience, and I've done this for quite some time now. So I'm going to try and be as absolutely honest as possible. I'll do the best and just explain why I'm in this field and uh, what I've learned about it, you know. And uh, there may be, um, you know, yoga teachers here who, who teach Kundalini and teach breathing techniques and stuff like that. I can only give you the ones that work for me. And it might be exactly the opposite of what you do for you, you know. Because I honestly believe that what you're looking for is in here. You know, it's not out there. So that's basically what tonight is, is to my own self be true. And um, because I think if you keep going outwards to experts for answers and it's not working, you can always blame them because it's not working, see what I mean? If it goes right, then you've found a guru to follow until it goes wrong, you see. So I think there's an inner guru in everybody. But the difficult thing is to take your eyesight from expectation into inspect. So we go from expect to inspect. So that's what tonight's going to be. You know, it's going to be got any neuroscientists here? No, no, seriously. It was, you know, so neuroscience is getting into this, you know. Uh, more and more now and science is beginning to show that maybe what those chaps were saying three to five thousand years ago might have some relevance in this modern world you know, so that, that's what this is about basically um, if you want an example of how it works Louis there at the back here. you just have to look at that peace <laughs> tranquility <laughs> and, and um, still work to be done but um, okay shall I start then all right. Thanks very much, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, by all means, um, ask any questions. You can say, Joe, what do you mean by that and all that, you know. And I'll try my best to answer them as honestly and as clearly as I can. But uh, my name's Dr. Joe Delaney. I've got all those letters after my name. That means I'm dead clever. <laughs> right. Um, I'm not a doctor of medicine. I'm a doctor in medicine. The difference is that I've done a PhD in a medical subject. And I did my PhD at the University of Liverpool. Just have to mention that's a red brick university, right? <laughs> and um, my field of supposed expertise is trying to work out how psychological stress, particularly, impacts the rest of the body. You know, is there really a body mind connection, or are these two things separate? You know, brain heart, heart brain, and stuff like that. And what I found out surprisingly is that what you think in here, right? reflects in here and vice versa okay so um as i say that's me handle i think they call that handle at dr joe delaney if you put that into google right you'll you'll pick up your criminal record first <laughs> and then you'll pick up with me twitter tweets and all that but if you go on to dr joe delaney.com there's some stuff on there um and really it's about this does anybody know what that is it's a medical sign yeah does anybody know the posh name for it there used to be a yoga magazine named after this. It's called the Caduceus. And the Caduceus is intertwined serpents. Yes. Okay. 
And what a lot of medical doctors don't know, and I'm not knocking them, you know, I mean, they know a lot. They think they do. Oh, did I say that? But um, <laughs> they know a lot. But the caduceus, you can see that it's two intertwined serpents. And basically, that represents human development. And as we go through life, we ascend through various stages. And so the first one here is connected to the root chakra or chakra. Okay. But most Western medics don't know that it's connected to subtle energy medicine. They think it's all mostly to do with biomedicine and the physical body. But in actual fact that as we come here, we're born in here, and we ascend through these various seven stages of life. And if anybody's into psychology, Maslow knew about this. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And Maslow initially started off with a triangle with five stages. Ten years before he died, he introduced two more. So it actually coincided with a lot of Eastern philosophy. Because most of, most of Eastern philosophy works off the fact that there are seven energy centers located in various parts of the spine, right, that correspond with the endocrine glands. Now, I know this sounds a bit technical, but it, it become more clear as I go along. So as we go through here, right, what's supposed to happen is we expand in consciousness. This is why they start to become more wide. So we've got the root chakra, sacral chakra, solar plexus, heart, throat, brow chakra, and the crown chakra here. So I'm going to talk about that. And if you go through life in a balanced way, then your understanding of what life's about expands. And first, because before you pop off, you gain your wings, but you have a clear view of that was good, that, you know, and some people think that was good, that I think we'll come back in another form and do another sort of thing. So that's what that means is. But... I've also developed, this is where I'm going to flog something here now. I've developed this approach called the I am approach. And the I am approach stands for internal asset management. And all it means simply is it's about emotional development. But the assets are the things in you that you're strong and good at, not the things. So it's the things in which you're strong, not what's going wrong, you see. And in the world that we live in, unfortunately, we tend to focus on the stuff that's not good and try and improve that. And most people are not naturally inclined to that stuff, you see. So it's very forceful. Education, in a true sense, in my opinion, educe means to draw out of. And I think what we tend to do is we tend to pour stuff into kids now, right? And it actually blocks their natural enthusiasm and stuff like that. You know, so we'll talk, I don't know whether you agree with that, there's lots of nods going on. But maybe what we really need to do now is to stop what we're doing, start getting all the rubbish out of the way and allowing them to express themselves from their authentic, essential selves. You know? And what happens then is, the more you do stuff that you're good at, the more enthusiasm you have, the more you enjoy life, the stronger you feel, the more your self-worth increases and you start to enjoy yourself more. I think the other system enhances fear, anxiety, depression, and you know, all that other stuff. So that's what this is about tonight. The I am approach is really, it's a cleansing mechanism. You know. But it doesn't take away the fact that we're all personally responsible for the choices that we make. You know, I wouldn't want to do that to anybody really. But. So who I am, I've explained that. The Great Awakening, I'm going to talk about what supposedly happened on the 21st of December 2012. There was supposed to be a great shift in what was happening in the cosmos. And it's supposed to have impacted upon our life here, changing thoughts and causing all sorts of consternations. So I'll explain that. Uh, we'll talk about evolution and ascension. I've sort of, um, you know, gone on a bit. But it's all about energy. And then Kundalini and Shakti. What does that mean? What is Kundalini? You know, why is it associated with a serpent? And then we'll go on to what, what we're going to do in the future. Does this sound all right so far? Yeah. Is everybody warm? Yeah. It is warm in here, isn't it? So where's me, Pete? I won't spend too long on this. Well, I might do, because it's all about me, and it makes me feel good. But um, <laughs> my medicine's stress in the heart. I am something called a consultant principal lecturer in integrative medicine, depending on where I work, because I'm associated with Wirral Metropolitan College, where I have a clinic, um, Ed Shield University, and also the University of Liverpool, where I teach evolutionary psychology. But um, I was, for five years, I was a senior research fellow in medicine at Arrow Park in Clatterbridge, uh, mostly in the renal ward. But also I did a lot of stuff with type 2 diabetes and things like that. 
Um, so there basically, that just goes to prove that I'm a sort of scientist first and foremost. But I've got an interest in the, the other side of things. Commonly called the woo-woo side of things. <laughs> Yoga, by the way, falls into woo-woo. <laughs> um, and so that's my field, really. It's uh, integrative medicine, it's psycho neuroendocrino immunology. Okay, and I'll be asking you about that later, but what the psycho bit is, the psycho bit, what's actually supposed to happen is how we think and how we see the world generates, if you like, a magnetic effect. And that consciousness, depending on the level of our consciousness and how we use it, right, generates an energy which stimulates the transmission of electrons or electricity in our nervous system. So there's the link. How you think will impact upon how your nerves work. You like this? Right? How your nerves work at those seven endocrine glands will determine how much stuff goes into your bloodstream. So we secrete endocrine, you know, we secrete hormones from our endocrine glands. That then will go into the bloodstream where it will impact on the surfaces of stem cells. So the biochemical messages that you send in your bloodstream, right, will impact upon the way your stem cells, right, um, affect the way your DNA works in the cells. And your DNA codes proteins. So in the end, what actually happens is how you think will determine the proteins that are expressed. So you are what you think, literally. You know, and this is becoming more and more known now. That how you think in the will determine how your nervous system works, will determine how your endocrine glands work, or your chakras, and we'll talk about the chakras, and then how your immune system and your blood works. Does that make sense? Okay, so really what I'm trying to get to in this one is, and I'll show you later is, if you're responsible for the way that you think, then maybe you're responsible for a lot of the physical stuff that's happening as well. Okay? Okay. So that's psycho neuroendocrine immunology. Or integrative medicine. Could you have a countdown? No, I've had to practice that. It's taken me, me seven years to say that, but I never tell you. Someone said to me, can't you just call it holistic medicine? Well, it's okay. So it's, it's vibrational, it's, um, it's um, frequency, it's all those things. All to do really with the frequency of our brain waves. So how your brain waves work will determine how you send energy via your nervous system, that's like the electricity system, and how your hormone, you know, your glands work. And that's why each one of the chakras, excuse me for doing the pointing, but uh, each one of the chakras, if you think certain things, you can exacerbate certain chakras to work in. You know, for example, if you look at some sort of pictures, sometimes you can have, the, anyway, I'll leave that one. But, um, <laughs> but that's what happens is you see something, right? You immediately get an endocrine secretion, which changes the way that you feel. So there's an emotional reaction your feelings then determine the actions that you take, you see. So, you know, we are responsible in more ways than we possibly realise. And this is what I've come to learn. But um, the most important thing is, of all those things, I'm also these things as well. I'm like real sort of, I'm almost like a genius. Really. <laughs> <laughs> but the most important thing of all that, of all that there is, I'm an extra one to You know, and, and this is true because um, just over... 26 years ago, I, um, after years and years of stress, anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation, I made a really, really serious attempt to do myself in because I didn't know what the hell to do anymore. And people used to say to me, you've got such strong willpower. Because, I mean, I've done a couple of PhDs and stuff. So, I mean, from a cognitive point of view, I can think things through. But about in the emotional state, I just didn't have a clue, you know. And so I was very knowledgeable Right, but about myself, I didn't have a clue, you know, and that's why I'm into this now because this is based, this talk is based upon my personal lived experience and what I've learned. And um, my big problem is, and somebody who looked after me in the first years of getting better, right, he said to me, Have you ever heard the expression, no all knows, oh, I can't say that, no, um, <laughs> no all knows next to nothing? And I said, Yeah, I said, You keep asking me that, why? He said, Joe, he said, Every time I say something to you, you say, I know. He said, it's very, very clear that you've just tried to take your own life. So you basically know next to nothing. And it sort of hit me like that, you know. And from that point, lots of things happened to me. Just let me tell you about the day that I decided to do the dirty deed. 
I felt really, really calm. Right? I woke up in a calm state and I thought, I've got to end it now because I've heard so many people. I was hurting myself and the family just, they had to disown me in the end. Um, I'd become homeless, you know, I was begging, all these sorts of things. You know, I know you can't believe that now, but I'm, when I look back and see that person, I can't identify with them at all. But that's the way my mind had become. I'd become so closed in that I really couldn't think clearly or see a bigger picture at all. And looking back, it was horrendous when I was going through it, you know, but I could see that there's a sort of a purpose in it now. Um, on the day, and because I'd been a biomedical scientist, I got a pestle and mortar type device out, and I got a whole load of paracetamol tablets, I had some sleeping tablets as well, and I mixed them all up. Got a bottle of sherry because I couldn't afford whiskey, you know, so. And I mixed it all up, and I swallowed this concoction, and then this peaceful feeling started to come on me, and I started to, like, to descend into this real peaceful feeling. Right, and I thought, thank goodness for that, it's all over, you know. And then, right, I started to get like an epileptic fit and I thought, oh God, you know, I can't live properly. I can't die properly. This is a tricky situation, you know. And I'm making light of it now because this is what happened to me, right. But it didn't start off like that. It started off as a young 17-year-old, full of enthusiasm, who was going to make his way in the world and stuff like that, you know. So I'm going to show you the, the progress and what I've learned about myself. And basically the problem was that my vision was looking outwards when really it should have been looking inwards. And for those people who follow Maslow, most people have to go through this almost dark night of the soul bit where their world seems to be falling apart. It seems to be part of the plan. And if you're in that situation and finding it difficult, honestly, there's a solution. And the first thing to do is just stop, just sit. And just wait for a bit without trying to work anything out. But I'll, I'll explain this. And in the second half, I'll explain how you can get in touch with a different energy that's in your heart. And this is what yoga is about. It's stopping the consternation in your two hemispheres. And it's bringing all the energy into your heart to try and unify all this stuff. Does this make sense? I know it's got a bit quiet. Because I'm just trying to explain why I do this now. You know? And so I came out. I changed my direction away from biomedicine. And I got into the field of... Um, well-being and I learned how, uh, how to become an Indian head massage therapist, a remedial massage therapist, I'm a Reiki master, whatever that means, you know, and um, all these other things fall, fall, fell into place. So that's what that's about. Um, but yeah, the ex-drunk thing, I haven't had a drink now for 26 years. Um, I don't smoke anymore. Um, I try and keep myself relatively fit. I still like eating, you know, but I uh, can't have anything. Uh, I, I do a lot of um, physical exercise. I do a lot of stretching and stuff like that. But more than anything else, I've learned that by certain breathing techniques and by changing your emotional state, you can just change how you think straight away and make better choices. And any questions so far? Does it make sense? Yeah. Right. So that's why I'm sort of into this. But really... Yoga means union. And there are certain philosophies in yoga that believe that from a cosmic point of view or cosmological point of view, that the universe goes through four phases. And as it goes through one phase, it then moves up a level and goes in sort of a spiral way towards more and more understanding. And we're just coming to the end now, apparently in yoga philosophy, of something called the age of Kali, which was the age of destruction. And there are certain characteristics that go along with these certain ages, like everything seems to be falling apart. You know, and that's what seems to be happening. That systems collapse. People start to get more and more ill. Right? People start to get more and more emotional, start falling out with one another and all that. So that's yoga philosophy. And they believe that what's happening now is we're coming to the end of this Kali Yuga and into Satya Yuga now, which is more an age of enlightenment and almost like the golden age. But it wasn't just um, Sanskrit and Hindu philosophy that believed that. It was also the Mayans, you know, South American Mayans. They believed that what we... People thought it was going to be the end of the world because we misinterpreted it. But they called it the end of times. And what the end of times was, right, it was basically how we move out of one dimension of consciousness and we get moved into the next dimension of consciousness. And that corresponds, as you see, with the yoga philosophy as well. But also the Native American Indians, right, they believe the same. So indigenous tribes seem to know more than what we could find out on Google, you know, because they were into natural cycles. We live in now a sort of 
Gregorian calendar, nine till five, year in, year out, one day, 24 hours thing. We've moved away from natural time and we're in a forced time now. And what seems to happen is living in this forced time, we've moved out of our natural bio rhythms. <coughs> and to me, yoga is an attempt through breathing in a particular way to put us back in touch with our natural cycles. You know. And that's why when you're tired, the best thing to do when you're tired is to sleep. When you're hungry, eat something. When you're thirsty, eat something. You know. But what we tend to do is now, in a nine till five culture, or even more than that now, as 12 o'clock comes, right, we start to develop this hunger feeling. You know, Most people are eating now and overeating, not because they're um, hungry, it's because they develop a psychological hunger-like feeling and mostly to do with stress. It's okay. So we'll talk about that. So 2012, what's supposed to have happened is there was a cosmological shift into a different level of consciousness. And what came with that was extra pressure, if you like, from the universe. And this seems to be being borne out now in what's happening to the world globally. You know, and, and please don't believe any of this. But I didn't believe any of this until I sort of started to be getting... Uh, in meditation, getting all these sorts of answers and things. But um, neuroscience is what I do for a living. Is It's a multidisciplinary branch of biology that combines anatomy, physiology, psychology, um, I think geography should be in there as well, and stuff like that. But it's basically a conglomeration of all the sciences put together to try and make sense of what's going on. Okay, But this chap here, Eric Campbell, right, he believed that where medicine was failing is, forgot to take in the effect of consciousness and how people think. And he believed that perception, once we understand how we perceive things, then medicine will start to understand more about what's going on in a holistic point of view. Now, the thing about perception is, do we all see the world in the same way? No. Yes, we do. We all see it in the same way but we don't perceive it in the same way. And that's, and I'm gonna show you what I mean by that in a minute, because I mean, this is a science talk as well. But we all are receiving the same information from the environment, but we we'll all be filtering that information based upon how we've been brought up, the belief systems that have been laid onto us and all that sort of thing. So I'm gonna show you something in a minute which will prove <laughs> that we don't all see the same thing at the same time. So perception and how we think determines what we see. So there's a phrase, we don't see the world as it is. Does anybody know the rest of it? We see the world as we are. Okay, and that's why two people can be seeing the same scene and see completely different things. Okay, and that's why we all see partial truth. And if we share what we see and put it all together, we'll get a bigger picture. But people want to say, well, no, I'm seeing it, and this is the only way it can be. So we fall out over that. So I feel like Father Delaney now. Oh, bless you. No, we fall out over that. And the to feel how it's going to do something. <laughs> so it's all about that energy. So if you can just try and re uh, remember that, because I'll be asking you. <laughs> this, is, this is modern medicine's view of energy. And if you're tired, it's probably because one of these components is not working properly. Right. And seriously, you know, so they'll say, oh yeah, if you're tired, we've done the test and we found out you've got a glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Well, how do I fix this? Take one of these tablets, see if it works and come back in six weeks. Right. And when that doesn't work, they'll look for a different enzyme deficiency and then another, then another. I'm hopefully going to show you a method tonight where you can go the other way around here and you can actually tune into your heart and you can actually send a different message all the way back through these biochemical systems because all these are really are proteins, right? And if anybody's read any Louise Hay stuff, you know, she believed that all physical illness, all, now please don't believe this, but all I'm saying is, sit with it a bit and just try and work out where to go. She believed all physical illness started in the dimension of consciousness. And how you think determines, like I said before, of what you physically become. Okay, and some people say, well, it might be heredity, it might have been passed on. I'm going to even talk about that then. You know. Okay, so that's all about energy. And most people, you know, they go to doctors, and the biggest complaint that GPs get is, doctor, I'm just tired all the time. T-A-T-T, -T, they call that, tired all the time. And so we go through the normal rigmarole, what are you eating, what are you doing? 
Most people I know who are in work are exhausted, you know, for trying to drive themselves on through this exhaustion all the time. And that's what I was like, that's what, what happened to me is, I started off in pathology, and uh, as it got better doing the job, they, they, um, they put me into managerial positions, took me away from what I really loved, and I sort of get ensconced in doing administrative work, which I hated. I can't manage people, I can hardly manage myself, you know. But I was trying to manage people, manage the labs, manage this, and I just hated every minute of it, you know. So the drinking started and the stress. I think, let me try and remember this, because I'll go all over the place here, but anxiety. Angustia, which is the root word from the Latin, means a tightening or a narrowing of the throat, okay? And that's why when people get anxious, they can feel their throat closing over. That's part of what's called the fight or flight response. So if you can do more mindfulness and body-centered awareness, you can then become much more sensitive to what your body's doing. So you can feel your throat closing, even though you don't know why it's happening, you can say to yourself, hang on a second, I'm having a fight or flight response here. I need to step back rather than drive myself on. See what I mean? So that's the first thing is, I feel tense. I can't really make any clear decisions in this tension. I'll step back, settle down, and then I'll think my way through it, really. And that sounds easy to do, but when you're in instinct, it's very, very difficult to detach from that. Okay? And that's what we're talking about here. Here's the brain, you know, and these are all, there's apparently... There's billions and billions of connections in the brain. Do you, have... you like that? You like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's I almost like one of your, you know, those slush, expressive sort of things. But in the middle of the brain is something called the corpus callosum, and it's like a sort of, it's the midpoint. It's almost like a telegraph tower. And what actually happens is most people in stress, they default to one side of their brain or the other thing because they learn their default mechanisms from the first seven years of their life, that's where they develop their defensive mechanisms. You know, I mean, it might be six years or it could be eight years, but you know, they say, give me the child until he is seven and I will give you the man. That's what the Jesuit said. And what they meant by that was, in the first seven years of life, it will determine how you characteristically respond to similar situations. And you can't change that until you, I'll show you the technique on how to change it. The heart has its reasons, of which reasons knows nothing. And that's basically, you know on the 2nd of January when you say, for the next month now, I'm not going to have any chocolate, right? I'm going to have a low carbohydrate diet, I'm not going to smoke and I'm having no cigarette, you know, I'm not having no... When you really, really mean that, with all your heart and soul and everything else, right? And on day 10, your head starts to say, oh, I've had a hard day today. Chocolate, are just, I'm only going to have these two chunks, you know. And then you're lost, aren't you? Because loads of people do that. They make you New Year's resolutions, you know, and they can't carry them through. And this is a lot in health as well. You know, people with type 2 diabetes try and change their diet and stuff. That's why habit, so deeply implanted in our psyche, you can't generally change it with a thought. The thought in here hasn't got the power to change what's going on in here. But there is a way. You know, there's hope. There's hope. And it's a bit like saying, you know, I'm going to be a bit crude here, but when you've got diarrhea and vomiting because you've got food poisoning, you know, and you can feel the urge, you know the urge, if you felt the urge before, you know, you can't really say to the urge, just hang on a moment or two, you know, because it's an instinct, you know, hang on a moment or two, it's inconvenient, you know, come back in half an hour and I've got some time. You can't, you see, because when an instinct kicks in, this, no matter how powerful it is, can actually stop that happening. And that's the basis of old habits, Addictive behaviour, it's all to do with emotional responses to past behaviours. I'll explain as well. So what we tend to do is, and we do this a lot in health. Just let me put that back. In health, we try and give people more information, more knowledge. And more knowledge blocks them from what they really need to find. Because knowledge is coming from the external. And really, what we need to find out is, how do we operate as individuals? So we need to help people to turn their heads around and look inwards and develop intuition. And if you look at the word intuition, it just means to be taught from within. So this is basically, as Maslow said and Carl Rogers, another psychologist, human, humanistic psychologist, he believed that what had actually happened is we'd lost our ability in trusting ourselves. You know, 
And maybe that's what crises are, existential crises like the one I had. I started to realise that maybe I started should start trusting myself in, in, instead of what my mother told me. My mother's still going. I love her, but I don't listen to her words. She's <laughs> So we need intuition, and intuition is associated with emotional intelligence. And the world seems to be moving more and more to something called emotional resilience and well-being. And I think that is the way forward, because we've sort of been a nation, especially in the UK, we've been suppressive and repressive. And what tends to happen is, when I drank, it temporarily disinhibited me, and all that energy that I've been pushing down for years started to come up and it made me feel wonderful, you see. But when I woke up the next day, all the suppressive mechanism was back in, so I needed, do you see how that works, you know? And then what happens then is, after the point, it doesn't matter how much you drink, it can't release anymore, you know, and that's where the trouble really starts. You know? Okay, so that's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is having a whole storehouse of information based upon past experience, but intuition works from moment to moment to moment. You just go with how you feel and you feel confident enough to go forward. And it's called hacking physiology to change psychology. Anybody know what they are? And they're the chakras. And what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and link autonomic neuroscience, that's the nervous system and the endocrine glands, to what the chakras do and their place in these things. And that's what that is really. On the left hand side we have a picture of um, the spinal cord and how the nervous system, the nervous system is just a wiring thing, that's basically just a wiring diagram, you know, and sometimes some organs get too much power and sometimes some organs get not enough power, you know, and I explain as we go along that this is, yoga means union, a union of what? Well it's a union basically of the two sides of the nervous system. One's an accelerator and one's a brake. We're generally living in a society now where the brake's full on, but the accelerator's full on at the same time. So we're burning ourselves out all the time. In yoga, we have two channels called nadis, and a lot of you will know this, Ida and Pingala. One's masculine, one's feminine. The autonomic nervous system has two. One's masculine and one's feminine. The masculine is called the sympathetic nervous system, and the feminine is called the parasympathetic nervous system. You know, in Chinese medicine, we've got yin and yang. So in all cultures across the planet, they understand this duality or relativity of nature. But we tend to be out of balance. And when we're out of balance, we're diseased, diseased, or ill at ease with ourselves. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we feel, how do you know when you're out of balance? Because you feel emotionally disturbed. So I'm writing a book at the moment. I'm becoming very famous overnight, really. You know. As well, do they consider I've become, you know, an overnight success? It's taken me 17 years to get here. You know. But um, what I'm writing a book at the moment is called the um, "There's No F in Stress When You Focus on Feelings First, You know. And the academics hate that; they can't stand it. But it's focus on feelings first is F off, you know. And it's not meant to be horrible, but people seem to remember that. But if you focus on your feelings first. You've got much more of an idea of what's actually going on between your head, between your ears. So, let me just do this bit and then we'll put one of these little tests up. Over here, we receive information from our five senses. Our five senses, sight, sound, smell, touch and taste. You having that? Does anybody know the uh, technical terms? V? Oh, okay, I'll do it. It's like visual, right? A, auditory. K, fantastic. O, olfactory. Olfactory, and the one that not a lot of many people get, G. Gustatory. Fantastic. Vacog. Vacog. Visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory. And what that is, is we're receiving that information externally, and then it comes into this bit here. That's why different people have different tastes. <laughs> different people see different things. Different people smell different things. It's because as the sensory information comes in, it associates something with something in the past. See what I mean? That's how it associates and relates to things. Now, if the past memory is a false memory, 
and you'll always perceive the world in a false way. You see what I mean? So this is this is what's happening. All this is where PTSD and working with people with PTSD come from. So we receive information, we perceive it, we go back into our hippocampus where we pick up uh, information, we come back, we make a decision, we go forward. In yoga, what we do is we sense something, we perceive it, we don't even go up there, we work beyond memory, and then we make a decision based upon now. Okay, so there's no relationship to the past anymore. That's what they say, living beyond memory means that we don't hook up to what's gone on before. We just live in this eternal now moment. Okay, put your hand up if you see it turning clockwise. So clockwise is that way, anti-clockwise is that way. So clockwise, put your hands up. Okay, hands down, anti-clockwise. Oh, look at that. Half of you, perfect. Now, before you say it, she's not changing. I know I'm from Seacom and I haven't caused, come to cause trouble, but she's not changing. When I asked you, and this is a real, when I asked you, put your hands up if you see it clockwise. Half of you sort of going clockwise, half of you sort of going anti clockwise. How come? Our position in the room. Your position in the room could be that. Ah, which side of your brain's working? So you see, she's not yeah, changing. She does. Yeah. It's the way. Yeah. Have you can see it both? Well, I'm not working. Well, seems to Some of you might need to see me for private consultation. <laughs> I'm very, very expensive, but you know. So go on then. So let me just explain what's happening. This is really, really important because this is what yoga is about. Okay. If you can only see it going one way, in stress, we will default to the hemisphere that's most active from our childhood years. This is so important. This. And most people have got no idea because they're seeing the world from a one-sided point of view. And if the information, so we're all seeing the same signal, but the information's coming in, the photons are hitting our retina at the back of our eye, that's then changing then to an electrical signal which goes down the optic nerve to our occipital cortex, these are the technical words, occipital cortex. Depending then on your default mechanism, you'll either send the information to your right hemisphere, your right part of your brain, or your left. If it goes to your right hemisphere, you are, um, you'll see it going clockwise. That's identified with a feminine characteristic. Okay. Most females, and it's a generalisation, I'm not trying to be sexist or anything like that, but most females see a bigger picture. They can see the whole picture first. They tend to be multi-dimensional, multitasking. Would you agree with that, ladies? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't, yeah. isn't, that <laughs> isn't that to do with the corpus callosum? No, the corpus, well, the corpus callosum could actually be a block. I'll explain in a second, just bear with me. If you see it going the other way, which is more con um, concerned with um, left linear, logical sort of programming, that's more masculine. And what you tend to see is small particles, right? And that's why men always get caught out, because we think we know what's going on. Right? But women can see the bigger picture, you know what I mean? So ideally, in union, in yoga, we, could have, we need to have them working in harmony with one another. And that's why they need to cut, they need to go across the corpus callosum like a bridge. Mm -hmm. But there's so many obstructions at the level of the corpus callosum that yoga over time can actually de-obstruct that process through positive emotion. So is that how I was able to like a flip between the two? Yeah, yeah. if you can flip between the two, the, the idea is if you can stay flip between the two, and you can you can get this. If you if you want that, let me just do it again for you, and I'll show you the way to do it. Ideally, it's a training mechanism, this, because if you can relax enough and breathe in a very synchronous way, you can actually get it to go once, twice. And what that's doing is it's improving that bridging across hemispheres. So it goes from a wave, and you know, an analog signal to a digital signal. And that's exactly, it's almost like quantum physics, this. The wave turns into a digital signal and then you take action then, okay? So it comes in from the cosmos, into the right brain, into the left brain, into the ground. I'll explain more as I go on. So on this one now, let's just, does this make some sort of sense? So, so this is all to do with neuroscience. Okay, clever me, don't you think? <laughs> 
So there you go. So put your feet flat on the ground. Just as best you can, just relax your eyes and just make your eyes go nice and soft and gentle. Become aware of your nose and just allow your nose to soften. Become aware of your jaw and just relax your jaw. Just sort of breathe out through your jaw and let it relax. And just gently and softly gaze at her ankles. And as you breathe out, just imagine that you're sending the breath to her ankles and drawing in. So all the way out, all the way in. And as you breathe out, allow your shoulders to drop as you sink deeper and deeper into a beautiful state of restfulness. The harder you try, the harder it will be to change. And the more that you drop into this state of relaxation, you should start to see her now changing more often. Has anybody seen her starting to change? Yeah. 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 Quite a lot of you are. That's good. Okay. And now the next thing is, as you breathe in, take your gaze all the way up to her head. And as you breathe out, take it down again. And if you get good at it, there's almost like a spiraling effect. Yeah? Yeah? Good. This is, it's just an indication, but it's useful just to show how through breathing you can alter the direction of your nerve traffic. That's the start to changing old behaviours, and I'll explain more as I go on. Okay? All right, so that's that one. Somebody who knew about this was um, this fellow, um, Einstein, who was supposed to be... Not quite as clever as myself, but he was quite, quite clever. But he knew that when his head was locked, that he had to get out into nature. He used to like cycling, he used to like boating and stuff like that. When he was out in nature and he left his problems back in the lab, what seemed to happen is he restored his balance, but he got more inspiration because he talks a lot about inspiration and stuff. But he used to, he, he, I think he coined the expression to let your soft out, basically. Because we've become very hardwired and hard. And sometimes when we're under threat all the time, it causes, here's another technical phrase coming up, an egocentric contraction. We become very tight and narrow-minded. Okay. And in that position, even though that we think we're thinking in an expansive way, we're not at all really, because we're under threat. And I'll explain more as well. And he knew it was all about a balance. I even put that there in the colours of the rainbow, see? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Because frequency of colour and frequency and vibration becomes very important. And that's what yoga is about. Yoga will focus on certain areas of the body, will use certain, and they call chromato-optogenetics in the phrase, but using sound, right, phonons, and light, photons, once you get the vibration right, you can restore balance Sorry for pointing again, but yeah, so. you can restore balance in these bits and pieces, right? And what actually happens then is when all your chakras are aligned and at the right frequency, what actually happens is you get this Kundalini awakening effect, okay? You can get Kundalini awakening by taking drugs, certain drugs. You can get Kundalini awakening with Jameson's or gin or anything that's going at the time. And that's what actually happens is there's a disinhibitory effect that sends all your energy up your spine and it gives you like a bliss consciousness. But unfortunately, it's chemically induced. And when you haven't got the chemicals, then you don't get the effect. Does that make sense? Okay, so there is a way to change your frequencies of your chakras from internal. You can get them balanced in a certain way. And what actually neuroscience is showing now that by certain mindfulness techniques, you can increase the levels of dimethyltryptophan in your brain. And DMT, right, is supposed to be called the spirit molecule, and it's supposed to open you up to bliss consciousness and cosmic consciousness. You know, yogins have known this, or people who practice yogi, they've known this for about 3,000 years. We've just started to catch up, you know, in the next 10, in the last 10 years. We're starting to think, well, maybe they had something going in. So really, in the end, it's about the creation of a biochemical environment that then works on your stem cells that changes you. And, and all the asanas in, um, in yoga, the, the asanas are there really to open up channels in your physical body so that the energy body to come through can actually embody 
and spiritualize your, your physical body. And that's why things like Tai Chi, and I know this is yoga, but Tai Chi, they've known this as well. Tai Chi, when they're working on Tai Chi, it's about balance. So it's really slow, breathing in, moving really slowly, moving all, and it's all to do with energy body. But it's breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. It's all to do with movement, kinesthetic, breathing, and emotion. There's a thing that uh, some of you may have done Tai Chi Yang for, but there's one that goes like this, moving from there really slowly, bending over like this. It's all to do with breathing. That's called grasping the swallow's tail. In Sikkim, it's called <laughs> trying to catch hold of the pigeon. Like before he gets away, represents the bush, you know what I mean? So I, I can take the Mickey, I, I, I'll take the Mickey, I can take the Mickey out of Sikkim because that's where I'm from, you know, and I love Sikkim and I love going back So the whole point again is it's all about movement, breathing. You know, it's supposed to be about gracefulness, really, and ease, working it at ease. Okay, so far? Mm -hmm. I know it's, it's hot in here, but... So Albert Einstein, and he believed that it was really... That's the infinity um, sign symbol. And to me, he felt that the human being was a process. It was an activity. It wasn't a single stuck thing. That everything's changing all at the same time. And what we try and do is we try and pin it down and in a linear way plan things and work towards it and life doesn't seem to be like that in fact it's speeding up that much as it seems to be on the subject of speeding up five minutes now is the same as it was a thousand years ago it's still five minutes what's happening is it's the amount of stuff in time that's changing and so our brain is having to process more and more information all the time so it's again it's the perception and the process that's causing the stress and tension. Okay? Say what you see quickly. Not supposed to be rude, this is psychology tool. <laughs> Say what you see quickly. A jug in water with a man. Jug in water. Mm. With a man, a man and woman on it. Man and woman. Yeah. Have, you got any, have you got any clothes on? No. I don't know. I thought you'd see that. <laughs> but, um, got no clothes on. What's the jug on? Water. Water. Is there anything in the tunnel? Like pulling teeth, this is there anything? Paper, it's on a piece of paper. Frame. The, the pacer, it's frame, it's turned over like that. Anything in the jug? Cork. A cork. Anything else? A sign. A sign. Yeah, a little sign. That's some writing. Okay. Louis, this is going to be good. Research has shown that young children cannot identify the intimate couple. <laughs> They can't see that naked couple in that bottle. Right, because they've got no such memory. See, there's memory again and associations. They don't see that. What children see is nine dolphins. <laughs> oh, <laughs> dolphins. Oh, dolphins. <laughs> okay, this is a test to see if you've got a dirty mind. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, yeah. Because, and this is the important bit, the you ready? Bit, this is yeah. the important bit. If you can't see dolphins within six seconds, <laughs> your mind is truly corrupted. Right. Tell me something I don't know. Right, exactly. Are there any girls who still can't see dolphins? Okay. <laughs> Give us your phone number. <laughs> Sorry, that was just a joke. If I was in university now, I'd be let down the gun. But look. I think as health professionals and people who are into health, if you can point something out to somebody, there's almost like a domino effect that goes on. I had this slide for six months, and this was the first dolphin I saw. Look, there's its tail, and there's its head. Look. Oh, yeah. And there's another one, and there's another one, and there's another one. There are nine dolphins. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. Okay. If you still can't see dolphins, please take my phone number again. Because you need treatment. Okay. But that's the important thing, isn't it? 
So again, I've got to take Oh, I can't. Yes, yes, I can. Oh, yes. All right, so what's actually happening is we have our cortex, our neocortex, and the, the cerebral cortex, which is the bit that we, we, we're objective about things. We can see clearly. It's not really influenced at all by our feelings. Most of us think that we've got that sorted and we can think clearly. But generally speaking, it's the midbrain where the emotional center is, called the amygdala or the limbic system. That's what really our subjectivity subtly influences our objectivity. And we think we're really clear on stuff. But when we look back, generally speaking, it's we're quite influenced by emotional state. Because feelings are much more powerful than just objective thinking. And in fear, what actually happens is we get something called, if anybody's, um, have you heard of the chimp paradox? Okay. Well, this is chimp paradoxical stuff, but this has been going for a long time. I mean, Hans Sale knew about this. In fear, all our energy goes into our protective mechanism. So when we're under threat or we perceive a threat, and we go into our midbrain defensiveness and our amygdala, our amygdala hijacks. We almost get like a sort of a lobotomy happens. You know what I mean? So all we can think of, we're in fear, we're in defensive thinking, right? We just want to get out of here. That's what stress is. I'm going to talk about stress is simply excessive pressure that takes us out of, a, takes us out of our optimal well-being level. So excessive pressure will kick in an automatic response called the fight or flight response. Most of us, whether we like it or not, are, are working from fight or flight. One of the first things that happens in fight or flight is we become contracted and tense. Does it make sense? It's called fight or flight because depending on your characteristics, you either dig your feet in and say, come on then, see, and we go into this. What actually happens is we get tense our eyes open up so we can see everything that's going on. Our sense of smell increases so we can pick all that up. Our jaw tenses, right? Uh, our, because this is the most powerful muscular response in the body. It's this. It's to bite your throat out, right? And if we're in this, in a politically correct environment, oh, it's lovely to see you. <laughs> they, they, do, they don't mean that, you know, they're doing the politically correct thing, but you can tell by their interaction that you just got them because they're next like that, you know. You see drunken people fighting. Them. But most importantly, head, neck and shoulder tension, because it's this, our pectoralis muscles tense, right, and we're ready to fight, or, depending on how we feel about fighting, the other way, fight, flight, fear. Some of us just go into fear and we just get blocked. Just makes sense. So this is subtly creeping up on us most of the time. How can we tell that over time we've been in fight or flight? Well, if you just like to stand up now. Yeah. I know this is spittle, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, it's a yeah. spittle. Yeah. And where there's, there's yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. So where there's blame, there's a claim, isn't it? It's spittle. Yeah. <laughs> If this hurts, stop doing it because it'll be you that's responsible, not me. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the disclaimer. You're responsible now. What I want you to try and do is, and please, if it hurts this, just stop straight away. I want you to take, this is called the reverse prayer in yoga. Take the palms of your hands and place them together in a downward plane pattern. Okay? Nice and relaxed. Relax your shoulders. And with the palms of your hands remaining in place, keep them together. Just gently turn them upwards, you know, and put them on the bottom of your spine like that. And then from there then, just move that up there, just nice and gently. And joking. just put it, you said you're joking? <laughs> okay, and just put them between your scapula, your shoulder blades like that. Okay, down you go. That's a little indication of chronic muscle tension. Okay, so I'll explain this more and more. If you've got a bit of space, if you've got some space on this one, nice and gently. It's almost like yin yoga this because it's using gravity and the forces of nature to take your body. So on this one, if you can, if you've got a bit of space, it's just allow gravity to take those palms of the hands, relax all your muscles, you can tell your muscles to relax, and just allow the palms of your hands to go under the soles of your feet, okay, without cheating. Okay. Up you come. 
Sit yourselves down. Just an indication, but a lot of people don't know that this has subtly crept up on them. The only time in reality that you should be in fight or flight is when your physical health or your physical well-being is, is threatened. Everything else can be stepped away from and could be dealt with in an emotionally calm and clear-minded way. Not a lot of people know that because a lot of people are so subtly in a threatened position that they're on the hamster wheel all the time. Does it, this make sense? Okay. If you can know that that's what's happening to you, there's two things you can do. You can carry on and you can live in denial, with, which is where I was for a long, long time. Or you can say, yeah, I'm reacting to something here that in reality, it's not that important at the moment it could be dealt with. And it's very difficult. One of my biggest failings, or people who knew me, they'd pick a whole load more, but um, one of my biggest problems was I was brought up to be a very polite and very helpful young man. I was brought up in a very strict Irish Roman Catholic background and everything that went with that. But the point about it is, I would do anything for anybody because I was told that that's the way <laughs> to get to everlasting life. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to have to say here, what I found out is, it was a lie. <laughs> because I didn't know how to say no, and this is the truth, I've become a gross people pleaser. And when anybody, no matter who they are, asked me for a favour, I would say yes, of course. Now I would do their work and they'd be off skiing in San Maritz or something. Like <laughs> and I was, no, this is true, this, honestly. I was building up year in, year out resentment after resentment after resentment, pretending to be happy with the situation. And the biggest problem I found with myself is I was in denial, lying to myself all the time, you know. And I became like Uriah Heep, you know. Because what was happening is it was intention. I was developing a hump like that. It was like, I call it pre-quasi-modo, you know, so you write a heap sort of merging into quasi. Oh, I'd love to do that, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and really, what I wanted to do, because this is what happened, is I got a few down, you what? You want me to, but I, you know, and that's what it, what it gave me, is when I drank, I could be more honest, because the Romans said that, didn't they? In vino veritas. From secret, that means once you get a few scoops down here, it all comes out. <laughs> You know, and so that's that's part of yoga is how you've got to take action to rebalance yourself. You just can't imagine here a new life in your head. You can if you like, but nothing ever changes. Unless you take the action to ground it, you don't get that neural influx to develop new neural pathways. And there's all sorts of other things that go on at the level of your heart. Does this make sense? Yeah. I'm only talking about my story, but if you can identify this and think, oh, yeah, you know, I'm one of them gross people, please. So, this is what's happening. Information comes in, that's the P, the perception box. We receive some sort of sensory information. What happens to our physiology when we perceive a threat? What happens at the level of the heart? Speed. Speeds up, doesn't it? Why does the heart speed up when we're greedy? Pump more blood around. Why does it pump more blood around? To prepare us for running away from the to danger. To prepare us to run away from the danger. What happens to our blood pressure? Goes up. Goes up. You get hypertension. Why does it go up? Um, under more pressure. Something to do with oxygen. Okay. What happens to our breathing? Faster. Goes faster. What for? To get more oxygen in. So we've got the heart beating faster and more strong, like that. Okay. We've got blood pressure going up because our, our vascular system con constricts. So that puts the blood pressure up. The blood pressure goes up to deliver right the oxygen more readily. But here's the thing: what happens to your throat? Oh, yes. Closes. It becomes narrow. See anxiety, narrow throat. Why does the throat close? In a situation of now, not a lot of physiologists know this, so you're getting some good information here. <laughs> right. Why does the throat close? Shut no. down the thing that doesn't. No, no. It's to constrict the airway so that the pressure in the lungs increases, so that the oxygen is delivered under more pressure to the alveoli and into the blood system. So it's to increase the blood, uh, the the oxygen tension in your lungs so it's delivered more. That's why. So we're breathing more, our throat's tight and all that. 
That's supposed to be a temporary thing to deal with an acute stressor. However, in a subtle sense, if the threat remains in place or our perception of it remains in place, then the body, which is a faithful servant of the signals that you keep sending it, will remain in place like that. Because that's why people go to the gym. The more they go to the gym and the more tone they put on, the more that their body will respond to the neuromuscular information that you're giving it. Does that make sense? Please don't believe me. If it makes perfect sense, then that's great. So really, what we should do at the end of the day is, okay, I live in a stressful world. At the end of the day, if you could unwind all the stuff that you've put in the day, that's called going to a yoga class, guys, then you've got a much better chance of living a better quality of life without all the pain. Because what happens is chronic muscle tension, we lose mobility, we put more pressure on the joints that could possibly lead to osteoarthritic conditions and so on and so forth. You can see someone who's got head, neck and shoulder tension when you're driving behind them, when they're looking to try and go, they, they, they go like this to look behind, they go like this, don't they? Their whole body moves. <laughs> You know, they're trying to park. Ideally, what's supposed to happen is the whole head's supposed to move. So my view is that if we taught children this from a very early age, right, to become more body aware and to do more flexibility, to do more mindfulness, to actually work with what's strong with them and not what's wrong with them, then probably the world would be a better place. But that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> and, any questions? Is it, is it making some sort of sense? Yeah. Do you think then that... Body, that we need some form of stress. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to talk about that in a minute. We need, we need normal tension, but we don't need hypertension mm -hmm. or we don't need hypotension. There is a bit in each individual where we're at an optimal tone. Optimal tone. When you find your optimal tone, you'll be able to work out when you're losing it or get, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you start to drive better. This is, this, how are we doing for time? Because I'll, I need to do two things. 46, great. So, let me just go back to that one. We have a negative perception. Our heart rate speeds up. Our instincts kick in, which de develop an emotional response. Because that's what emotion is. E is energy, motion, or action. Make sense? If you're tired all the time, sometimes you can't actually generate enough emotion. And so you sort of surrender to the situation and you stay in it. Okay. So energies, it's all about energy in the end. So we generate an emotion. That brings with it a feeling of negativity. So it's a negative feeling, negative perception, negative feeling. Our thinking under the surface then will um, influence our thinking above the surface. And that's how we make our decision. So many, many decisions that we make are defensive. Right. You can't be creative when you're living life on the defensive, right? And that's what we talk about, isn't it? So when you work with your heart and an open heart that's not fearful, then you've got much more chance of coming up with creative solutions. So again, it's about losing fear and growing. So that's the way it works. Our results are determined by our physiology. Can you change your physiology in fight or flight? Yes, you can. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Because... By changing our emotion and by changing the way we breathe, don't forget our breathing's gone fast. If we go into a more synchronous, slow, deep breathing rhythm, that's what the heart detector thing will show in a minute. And by supplanting a positive emotion for a negative one, you change the way that you feel. That changes the way that you think below the level of your consciousness. That emerges as more positive consciousness. You make better quality decisions. So it's changing your physiology to change psychology. What we tend to do is, and I'm not knocking psychology, we tend to try and change the behavior up here. But it's, also, it's all manifested here. But it didn't manifest there, it manifested there, between our ears. So it's a perceptual change that brings a physiological change that brings a change of choice up there. I mean... We haven't been looking at this for a long time. This is completely the opposite way that we deal with things, really. But anyway, I'll leave you to give that some thought. And this is the next thing everybody knows, or most people know about the iceberg analogy. The conscious <coughs> mind that thinks it knows what's going on basically hasn't got a clue. Right? <laughs> you know, I think I'll do this today. I'm going to lose a half a stone in the next week, and I'm really going to apply myself to it and all that. And the unconscious is going, 
<laughs> you know, and you do that, don't you? I'm not going to have that chocolate cake. And you see your, your hand stops moving. <laughs> it starts moving by itself, you know. And then, <coughs> I'm possessed by a hand that loves chocolate cake. And that's what happens. Is, and I swear to you, you know, my own personal experiences, uh, the people that I was with, I used to say to them, I swear to you, I swear to you, that I'm never going to drink again. I really meant it, right? Because they used to say to me, right, if you carry on like this, you're going to lose your job. If you carry on like this, you're going to lose your wife and children. If you carry on like this, you're going to lose your home. They were right. I'm not stupid. I'm doing a PhD. I can work that out. I can't stop doing what I was doing because it was coming from there and not from there. You see what I mean? That's the diarrhea thing I was talking about before. Because it was based on fear. And when I'm in fear, the defensive response comes up and that's the action that's taken. So you see, some people think that by shocking people out of behaviour it works, but it doesn't. It just sidelines it really until something else comes along. So that's another thing that I've learned is that it's to be more compassionate really and more understanding because if you've ever got a behaviour that you can't change, then you're in exactly the same situation as me. See, I've become follower of Billy Egan. <laughs> okay, so let's just go through this, but I just want to try and get to some more stuff. Here's the um, yoga then means union. And it means the union of opposites. It's a balancing of opposites. And as I said before, there's two nerves that determine your heart rate. Okay. There's an accelerator nerve called the sympathetic nervous system, and there's a, a brake called the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the vagus nerve. Okay, and what we can do is, in order to change the way our heart's beating and to make it work in a more coherent way, we can learn to breathe properly because the vagus nerve is directly linked to the way that the heart works. Because when we breathe in a in a not in a rhythmical way, our heart works in a sort of a rhythmical way. And I'm going to show you that in a minute when I strap somebody up to the lie detector test. But ideally, what we need to do is we do need a certain amount of pressure to get us out of bed in the morning, right? And each person will have a threshold which applies to their own characteristics. Some people can work at a very, very low arousal level, some people can work at a high arousal level, you know. That's perfectly normal for them. However, if your normal optimal level is here and you're working here all the time, you can see that your performance wise and your optimal well-being is diminishing. I was here for years and I didn't know. I would take caffeine, I would take handfuls of Pro Plus, I would smoke just so I could get some energy, external energy, to carry on with the lunacy that I was in. And then I'd be totally exhausted and I'd miss that point totally and I'd go back down here while my body tried to recuperate. And then it'd take more stimulants to go over the hill again and back here. And that's what my life was. My life was basically back and forward, back and forward, back and forward all the time. And I think, you know, a lot of us are probably in this situation. One of the characteristics was I'd go in, I'd sit down and I had a chronic inability to relax. Okay. I'd see, I'd see some, see that thing on the floor there? I had to go an hour or that ago. I became very OCD about stuff, so I'd do that. Pick that up, sit down, think, oh, I'll have a relax now. And I'd be up again, oh, there's another one there. So my mind was driving me on all the time. I was physically exhausted, but my head was doing a million miles an hour. I'd go to sleep like that, I'd think, I've got to get some sleep. So I'd fall asleep exhausted, wake up even more tired than I went to bed. Wild dreams and all that sort of thing. So, making sense? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so this is what's supposed to happen. You wake up on Monday morning, you hear the birds twittering, it's called the dawn chorus or the dawn phenomenon. Your heart rate starts to rise to a normal level because it's called waking up. Okay? You become mentally alert, your eyes widen a bit from a deep sleep. Right? Your mouth becomes dry because you don't need to be digesting pillows now and stuff like that. You know? <laughs> and so the blood goes back, you know, it comes from your visceral organs, your digestive organs, and it starts to fill your muscles so it gives you a bit of normal tension, so ordinary tension in your muscles with flexibility. This is where yoga comes in. So um, 
we then, our heart rate rises to a normal level. We get butterflies in our, that's the one where you get butterflies in your stomach because you think, oh, I'm going to work, I'm looking forward, you know that one? <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing my colleagues so we can all co-create a new world and all that. <laughs> okay. Our blood pressure rises to give us some oxygen and stuff. We get increased sweat because with sweat becomes more electrolytes and more salts. Our electrical system works more efficiently under that. Our nerves tingle. It's great to be alive. Our legs straighten, our back straighten, and our muscles tend to a normal level. However, under excessive pressure and constant stress, we become fuzzy headed. That's when you go into a room and you think, I know I've been in this room before, I've got no idea why I'm here. And you have to sort of retrace your steps. And then you get back over here and you think, I'm sure I'm just meant to deal with it. So you're almost like an animal doing that. And that's when you sit. You know when you sit at your computer and it says, what's your password? And you think, I've got no idea. <laughs> and you have to go to your diary because you know that you've put it on a certain page in your diary so that nobody knows and you can't remember the page. <laughs> so, you know, it's all that sort of stuff. Or you're sitting at the computer and you know you've got a job to do, but you're just staring at a blank screen because you just can't remember. You know? So memory loss is it? You're right. You can ID. You can ID with that one. Yeah. Or you look and you see one particular email from one particular person, and you're off, aren't you? And you've gone. Right. Okay. So you get fuzzy headed, dry eyes because your parasympathetic nervous system is associated with moisture. It's supposed to be. It's the feminine response. Technically, it's called the trophotropic response, which needs to nurture. Okay. So the vagal nerve associated with the feminine aspect of the person is also do with rest and digest. Whereas the fight and flight is the sympathetic nerve, the masculine, which is to do with fight and flight. If they're not working in harmony, then we're ill at ease, we're diseased, we're emotionally disturbed. Head, neck and shoulder tension, talk about that. Lack of taste. That's where if you find yourself eating more and more spicy stuff because you don't seem to enjoy food as much as you did. Sweet and spicy stuff. It could be just because all the blood that's supposed, all the blood that's supposed to be digesting stuff, and you get salivation and stuff like that. All the blood's actually in your muscles, waiting to punch somebody. You see, so there's a there's a mismatch. The big grip in the gut, that's a blood shunting effect, where all the blood from your viscera, your organs, is in your in your muscles. Right, that's why you get that grip in the gut because it's a your blood's changing direction. Heart rate rises and stays high, you get digestive problems, stress-related irritable bowel, all sorts of things, because again, the blood's becoming, it's, it's away from the digestive facilities and it's into your muscles, because you're in fight or flight. Chronic low back pain. Can I just say something about chronic low back pain? Most people haven't got chronic low, they've got the pain in the back, but it's associated with head, neck and shoulder tension. Because we treat loads and loads of people with chronic low back pain. And we go to their shoulder and they say, no, I've got a pain here, can't you? you take care of it, can't you understand? My pain's here. What's actually is, is it's this here. And because everything's connected, when they do that like that, this pulls up. You know, all the energy goes from their quadratus bumbori muscles, right? And it's all here. And so when you release the tension here by doing deep myofascial trigger point massage, that releases and the pain goes away. They think you're a miracle worker. But it's just because everything's connected, really. And that's why yoga comes in because it's increasing flexibility, which really realigns people with gravity and their postural muscles work better. Blood pressure stays high, we get lack of sensation, and we get thermoregulated problems. What I'm gonna do right um, now is, let's just have a little break and stand up and talk. Is that okay? And I wanna just set up this lie detector thing. The, the message is really is, Become aware of your breathing and become aware of your emotional state because that what that does is when you get mindfully aware of what your body's doing you can breathe the hook out because when we perceive something and it works below the level of our consciousness we hook on unconsciously you see and a lot of us feel uncomfortable but rather than stopping and the hook on ourselves we can either take medication we can take drink we can go for the smoke we can do all that, and carry on with the lunacy what I've learned now is if I get a grip in me gut, there's two sides of me, and this is where yoga comes in. There's part of me that's called my divine nature, which is the essential I am part of me. And then there's the ego. The divine part of me is never afraid. 
it never reacts or responds to anything you know so if you've got a grip in the gut it's just ego you know it's ego attachment and if there's an ego attachment you will go into what's called egocentric contraction right then you can't think clearly so the idea is how do i know i'm in ego well if you feel disturbed and you feel blocked and you feel uncomfortable you're in ego right and some people say well oh no i'm not Right, and I'll say, oh yes you are. And then you get angry, I'm telling you, I'm not, I'll say. So ideally, you see, the divine part of our nature doesn't need to defend itself in any way. That's the one that just keeps smiling, even though everything's falling apart and it just smiles all the time, basically. And that's what I've learned is I became, one of the first things that goes when you stress is your sense of humour, doesn't it? You know? And I, I try and, they call me, I work in the States with people as well, and they call me Dr. Lightheart, you know. So I'm trying to get across in a light-hearted way stuff about the real serious stuff in life, you know, because a lot of my friends are really suffering. And, um, you know, I work a lot with people with addictive personalities and stuff like that. But suicide um, uh, is increasing. And it's especially and in the young people as well. I work with a lot of young people and they're basically um, becoming more and more stressed all the time. So the pressure of exams kicks off the fight or flight response it makes them think less clearly so that their exam results are poor and so on and so forth. So I'm trying to get across the fact that if we're a bit more light-hearted in a serious <laughs> way, then we've got a better chance of um, you know, producing, not producing, but helping people to think more clearly. So what I want to do is who feels that they're pretty cool under pressure and who can for one minute just stay cool? Preferably somebody who's not on any heart medication. <laughs> <laughs> or preferably somebody who's not on any medication. Mm -hmm. Right, but if there's somebody here just for the benefit of this one minute experiment, just to show how what's going on in the mind affects the heart. <coughs> I'll do it. Thanks very much. Well, that's I can still tell me what to do, so you've already started. <laughs> <laughs> right. If you could count, what's your name? Jade. I knew that. Jade, I just wanted to see if you were telling me the truth. I should have not <laughs> So this is Jade, everybody, who teaches yoga here, if you don't know her. Can you put that on your earlobe, please? Okay. So basically, this device is very simple. It picks up Jade's heartbeat through a, through a pulse in her ear. You know, little light picks up the the heart going through. It's already changed just by sitting here. Um, I haven't done a single word. I never took no, it into anything else. Don't try and let it go start. <laughs> so, so, Jade, what I want you to do is, and this might be difficult, but I don't want you to say another word <laughs> until I say, please give me the answer now. Do you understand? Very good, very good. So, Jade, relax as best you can. And you know that yoga you're teaching, that relaxation, you can see now whether you're telling the truth or not. <laughs> okay, oh my god. <laughs> All right. Can you just see if you can put that more cleanly on your ear? Let's see. Should I take my earring out? That would be handy, yeah, because with it working on your earring, it doesn't work. Are you from Birkenhead? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so. Um, <laughs> oh look, 100% in the red. All right, here we go. Just bear with me a second. So this is seriously this. Okay, now we're getting there now. All right, Jade, I don't want you to speak. All I want you to do is relax to the best of your ability. And when I say go, and please do this as best as you can, as quick as you can as accurately as you can because it's only for one minute when i say go i want you to think of the figure 300 and i want you to subtract 17 from 300 as quick as you can and when you get to that figure i want you to subtract 17 from that so in other words serially subtract 17 from 300 if you lose it go back to 300 again this is all part of it so i want you to say okay so close your eyes and just in your head, I want you to work this out. Don't speak until I say, give me the answer. Nod if you understand what's meant. Okay. So, starting from now, 3, 2, 1, subtracting 17, serially from 300. Start now, go. 
<laughs> Jane, concentrate please. Thanks very much. And I'm going to try and, you know, I'll be talking, that'll be getting on her nerves, and this creaky floor, that will because she's trying to concentrate on shit stuff like that. And all sorts of things are going on, like the real world distractions. Aww. Excuse me. But um, all sorts of. And uh, um, you've done, okay, 20, 19, 18, 17, um, 16. <laughs> Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. What's the answer? Twelve. I mean, <laughs> two hundred. Two hundred and twelve. Do you say yoga is good for you? <laughs> right. So there's no answer. But um, what we should do now is just relax, shoulders. Okay. And when I do that with my arm, I want you to breathe all the way in through the nose, okay? And when I do that, I want you to breathe out through the nose, that okay? So nice and gently, all the way in through your nose, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five. All the way in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five. Big deep breath in. Making sure that your in-breath and your out-breath are the same length. And just keep going on that. All the way in. All the way out. Fantastic. Everybody can do this. Just keep going on that now. You all the way in. Going by yourself now. All the way in, all the way out. Settling down now into a nice, gentle, easy rhythm. Thanks, mate. really really important that, that when Jade was trying to work out that sum and it's a horrible sum and it's hard to do when someone's making all that noise she went into a threatened situation does that make sense you know and we're all going through this and there's information coming in and we're trying to deal with it the important thing is how we're processing information in our brain in our neural pathways in our neural processing centers right impacts directly on the heart so we're in a state of fight or flight. Makes sense? Okay. When she went into slow, deep breathing, you can see that her heart sped up and her heart slowed down. The important thing is she went right off the scale there when I was doing and all that sort of thing. Her heart rate went right off the scale. Right. And that's potentially quite dangerous. But if you're in that condition for any length of time, your heart adjusts itself. These things here in your carotid arteries, your barroreceptors, they reset it to a higher level so your blood pressure stays high because you're continually in a state of alert. Does that make sense? Okay. Your senses become more alert so you become more hypervigilant, right? And you just can't relax all the time because just in case. Okay. The idea is if you can practice, this is what I give me patients. You know, I used to have a, a, a clinic in Clatterbridge in the Arrow Park when I was in the hospital. And when patients used to come in, and the first thing you used to do is do, do a whole consultation and find out about them. You know, and, I, and I know most medics don't have this time, but I had a lot of time with them because that was part of the job. You know? And they would sit in the, the seat, and then, well, Jay, do us a favor. Would you come back? Do you mind if I just put my hands on your shoulders? Is that okay? Yes. So at first of all, I put my hands here and I just gently relax and get the client to relax as much as possible and get an idea of their breathing pattern. And most people tend to breathe up here in their sort of clavicular region, okay? And that's very short and sometimes they have a lot of tension in their head, neck and shoulders. So then the next thing I do is I get an idea of where there was tension, okay? And most of us, and this, ooh, that's a nice bit there, can you feel that? 
So there's, when you press on a muscle, these are dead simple things. These, ooh, that's lovely, that's lovely. See that one there? <laughs> it's not lovely for you, but when you press on a muscle, with any pressure, you should feel the pressure but no pain. If it's painful, it means that your muscle is shortened. Your muscle fibres are like that when they should be relaxed like that. Okay, so this is a chronic thing. So the idea is I would show them some techniques. Right. That's simple to... Oh, there's me pointing, yeah. And I would show them some techniques. And sometimes their husbands or partners would come in and I'd show them some gentle techniques. Or sign them up to a college course or something like that. Yeah. But what happens here is this is tense. These tend to start tensing here then. And we get tension in our biceps muscles as well. Okay. The thing about yoga and stretching is, and most teachers will tell you this, the stretch comes on the out-breath. It's so important because the out-breath is responsible for the parasympathetic and the increase in vagal tone throughout the body. So that's very important that when you do any stretching, you should be, this is where yin yoga comes in. It's the out-breath that's important. If you hold the stretch for eight to 10 seconds, your muscle will stay on the same place. That's called the maintenance stretch. If you hold it for three, 30 to 60 seconds, that's called the progressive stretch. And then you'll get lengthening of your muscle fibers. Make sense? So that's why yin yoga will keep you in a position where it's really uncomfortable, but it's to try and get over what's called the proprioceptive response and things like that. So that's the first thing. I would show Jade that. Then I'd put onto that machine and I'd show her how her breathing affects the way her heart works. Neuroscience has shown now as we get into psycho physiological coherence at the level of the heart, information is then sent up to the brain, right? It's sent up in a various ways through pressure receptors in the blood. There's also an electromagnetic wave that goes up. Brain waves patterns change. We change from beta um, brain wave into what's called the alpha theta state. And that's what we're really looking for. We're looking for alpha waves to increase because in alpha waves, you get a relaxed alertness. If you go any deeper, you start to sleep, you see. So we want alpha-theta brain waves. And in the alpha-theta state, we get an expanded vision, we get more choices, we get more groundedness, and we can make clearer choices. And it just comes from breathing in this way. Now, what also happens, and this is the next weird bit that's coming in now, we also open up this electromagnetic radiation, and that's when the chakras come into play. Now, the chakras are invisible vortices of energy. They're invisible, so you can't see them. But when you get good, you can start to feel them, okay? And you become sensitive to whether your chakras are out of balance or not. In order to balance the chakras in a rapid way, you go and open your heart. Because the three chakras then, the energy from those comes down into the heart, and the three chakras at the bottom come up as well. And you get like um, a yoga, a union, and that's what the mystical union is. It's when the feminine and the masculine coincide and correspond with one another and start to cooperate. And that's how you do it through that breathing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then what happens then is, and this is where the, the woo-woo's coming in now. From a mystical point of view, I'll oh, just stay with me for one sec, you all right? Yeah. And what we tend to do then is I would do some sort of Indian head massage on, on the clients and stuff. I'm, I'm a Reiki master as well, so I'd say I'm gonna do some Reiki. I mean, they didn't want it or I didn't do it. But generally I'd sort of work on that there and work on some of these sort of chakras here in the temporal region because sometimes when you can relax this here this comes online as well so you're working on all these different things can i just say when people started to tell me about this i wouldn't have it you know what i mean and somebody said to me i said oh that'll never work for me and they said you know the last time that you did it how was it for you i said i've never done it he said in tai chi he said there's a technique in tai chi let me just show you he said in tai chi there's a move and it goes like this. So he showed me all this, and he did all this, and he went like this. I thought he was mad, this fellow, didn't he? <laughs> he did like a snake thing, and then he went like this. He said, do you know what that means? I said, no. He said, don't knock it till you've tried it. <laughs> <laughs> he said, take the cotton wool out of your ears and shove it in your gut. Now, um, so that's what I do with the patients. I, I do that. And then I'd show them a simple opening of the heart exercise using an owl brush handle. Okay? I call this pole dancer. <laughs> just, and please, when you do this, be careful. Okay? So you just do that. If I'm allowed to say it like a milkmaid, it'd be a milk person now. Okay? So it's a milk person, right? So breathe in. 
And on the out breath, that's when the stretch comes. So you breathe in and out. A lot of people will just be able to get there. And then when you get good at it, maintain the stretch 30 to 60 seconds. When you get good at it. And what happens is when you get down there then, chest goes up, become more aligned properly with um, gravity, right, and stay there. Then you can do some gentle exercises like this so you get used to that. When you get good at that, then you can work it on this then and do it that way. And that gives a better stretch. This makes sense? Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can just do side bends and stuff. So you, in order, rather than push, you just pull down with this hand and sort of hold your, your side stretching. Okay. And then you can do all the stuff, you know, you can, you can really open it right up and do this all this. But you have to work towards all that then. And in the end, when you get really good at it, you know, you know, you can, and, and it's because this is, um, you know, you end up looking like you can go down there and head like that. He's <laughs> <laughs> like a yoga master. <laughs> you say to me, yeah, you're looking well. <laughs> so it then becomes about energy. And this is the hard part. And this is the hard part for people to get their heads around is once you get into coherent breathing, it's like another energy comes in. So I've mentioned Ida and Pingala. They're the two Nadis. And when Ida, the feminine, and Pingala, the mas mas masculine, sympathetic and parasympathetic, when they work in harmony, it's almost like a gate opens. And it opens what's called the Shashumna Nadi. And that's the central channel that balances all the energy. You, you've heard of it, haven't you? So the energy comes in from the root chakra, up your spine, Okay, and out through the crown of your head. And when they're aligned, that's when you get bliss consciousness. Okay, however, when there's an initial Kundalini awakening, you get this release and this natural response and like cosmic consciousness. You know, you think everything's wonderful. That goes away because the initial release is just releasing stuff that's been trapped for a long, long time. What then happens is this coiled serpent-like thing of energy starts to activate from the root chakra upwards. And it starts then to wake its way through all the chakras. And then when you get obstructed, you feel a, a, a pain or a, a disturbance. What it's trying to show you is that that's something that needs to be dealt with in a physical way. So pain is the touchstone of you improving. But when we have pain in the West, we tend to try and find some sort of method to reduce the amount of pain. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So basically, in 2012, this energy that came in, like the yogis and the Mayans have been talking about, it's called the truth vibration. And people are having um, kundalini awakenings, right? They're starting to get more of an understanding. They're starting to see how they've been trapped in this sort, sort, sort of a matrix of oppression. And they start to wake up, you see. So they immediately get this fury of, I'm not having it anymore, you know, and stuff like that. And they want to fight everybody. But the idea is, nobody did it to them. It's just that they're waking up to a more expanded consciousness. Does this make some sort of sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Kundalini is an energy, and it then will wind its way through. It winds its way through the chakras. It stops, and when it stops, you feel disturbed. When you feel disturbed, you step back, and you almost say to it, what are you trying to show me here? And if you've been a gross people pleaser and always said no, a yes, got to learn to say no, you see. And the more you say no and practice the opposite, the more the energy then moves up to the next level of experience. So it's all about expanding the consciousness, vertically developing, in a, a, a going up to ascending, they call it ascension. You know, so that's that. So the next thing you can do is you can help this. You can open the heart. Now, if Jay wouldn't mind, if you'd just like to stand up for me. What I show people now is, do you mind if I just put my hand here? So what I've been showing is, I just want you to just breathe here, gently, nice and gently, and just allow yourself to breathe, nice and gently. And what you might feel is, okay, just relax now, and just allow your breath to come. What you might feel is, you might feel as though your body's starting to move itself here in the air as you go up, as you go down. Okay, so what's actually happening? I won't let you fall now. So just go with this. So what I'm doing is, I'm opening my heart. There's a message gone through to her heart, right? Her heart's opening, okay? 
we'll be dancing in your book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to hang on to this. Are you okay there? Yeah. Okay, so just go with it. So what we can do then is, when you start, because I've I practiced this, you know, you can then start. Okay, I won't let you fall, so, but she's starting to come off her feet now because her, her kundalini is, oops, oh. amazing. <laughs> her kundalini energy is opening now and her heart's opening. And as her heart, there we go. So you see her feet going here now. As her heart's opening up, oh, it's nearly lifting her off her feet. So on this one now is relax your ankles now when it's coming, there you go. And relax your knees and just let your hips relax. Let your tummy relax, there you go. And just breathe nice and long. And ideally is she'll start to settle down, but she should be feeling her energy in the water. And in the end, you get good because you can sort of direct people now. And they're like, what's going on? <laughs> Have you ever been in the presence of one of the same people? <laughs> <laughs> Me either. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to stop you now. So put your hand on your heart. Put your other hand on your heart. Gently breathe in and out of your heart. And as you breathe out, just imagine that you're relaxing more and more. Collect any stress and tension in your heart and then breathe it out through your hands like that. And give it back to the back side. So breathe in and then out again. And just that simple technique will collect any obstructed energy and it will give it back out and then a, a balance will start coming back. And some people when I'm doing this is they go into like a spontaneous tight chair. There she goes, she's going out there. Can you feel that? Okay, so I'm going to stop you now, okay? Thanks very much. <laughs> That's called Shakti Pat. Right. And everybody can do this. It just means that you have to spend some time sitting in a coherent physiological state at the level of your heart. You know, it used to be thought that you'd have to do something special. So when I first got this, I thought that was like the second coming, you know, and I was going around blessing everybody. It's true. So honestly, for nine months, I was like on this savior complex, blessing everybody, you know. And all my mates were thinking, I wish that had stopped because he's getting on his nerves there. You know? And then I woke up one morning and it was gone. But what I realised was the person who taught me this, he was a Kung Fu master, right? He said, no, you've had a touch now of what this free-flowing state is like. Now you've got to work back to it by taking some action, you see. So it is about action. What I want to talk about Kundalini Awakening is, right, there's work to be done. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but we have a personal responsibility to stop, to turn our eyes that way round. And to basically say to our heart, what is it, please, that you're trying to show me? Is, is this a bit weird, or does it make some sort of sense? Okay. And basically, Tai Chi. In Tai Chi, you don't move. It moves you. So really, Kundalini Awakening is like a spiritual rebirth. It's when the energy body comes into line. It's what the Egyptians called the car. It's what the Native American, American Indians called the uh, spirit, you know, um, the Chinese call it qi, um, the Japanese call it ki. So it's this energy body. And what needs to happen is the energy body, or call it the soul if you like, the soul now is trying to get in and work through your physical body. And that's where I think yoga comes in, in the, in the sense of the, the exercises realign your physical body with the energetic flow so it makes it much easier then for the energy to come through. That makes sense. All the things you can do then is you can store this chi energy in case you need it for things and this see this here this isn't pork pies this <laughs> this is chi and i'll show you so you can store chi and use it for protection and stuff but let's just breathe in and i'm going to store some chi here now so I'm going to... it's almost like a pregnancy this does it look good on camera though <laughs> <laughs> if you push there now Solid, isn't it? Okay, so this is basically what the Chinese have been teaching for a long time is that you can use this spiritual energy, right, to actually defend yourself. You see, and all you need to do is put your breath into where it's needed. This is called Iron Shia Qigong, and you can do it in martial arts as well because when you're a martial artist, right, you can just send the energy to your fist, and this all becomes very tense. But I'm not putting any muscular tension into it. It's just the flow of energy, you see what I mean? 
And so that, that's what's on offer. And that's what's happening to people now is to realise that there's a lot of stuff going on in the invisible that you can tune into with a different state of consciousness. And what it brings with it, it brings a realisation that the human potential is much more, um, is much more potent than we possibly realise. Is that all right? Okay, any questions on that? Because I know it's a bit weird and stuff. But I, I really think that yoga and yogins and people who practice yoga for a long time, they knew that there was an invisible system. Just to go back to medicine and uh, biomedicine, they've just discovered a new organ, they're calling it. It's not a new organ, it's a system that's always been there called the interstitium. And that's the space between cells. And what they're finding out now is communication happens in this space between cells. They're called nadis. And that's what yoga's been going on about. Invisible channels of communication. And sometimes when you press on trigger points, right, it doesn't go down a nerve pathway or a dermatome or a myotomal pathway. It goes by some sort of invisible method. Yoga have been saying, well, they're called nadis. But medicine is now beginning to realise that maybe there is some communication happening. So... Solar flares come in, right? Impact upon what's going on on the earth. We're on the earth, we feel the vibrations. The vibrations travel down the nadis, down our nervous system, and impact upon our physical bodies. And we can actually tune in, right, and sit still with that and almost direct the energy for our benefit now as well. So that's what that's about. It may be, but don't believe a single word I say. <laughs> but, uh, Oh yeah, yeah. There's a Tai Chi method. Very important. This is important. If you find it difficult to say no, there's a, there's a few Tai Chi moves. So you get relaxed, okay. And if someone's like having a go at you for the first time, this is how you say no for the first time. You have to do a big sweep like this and bring your heart into it. Move your hip into it like that, and then go. <laughs> <laughs> I've told you once. No, that means once. <laughs> The second one is a real big sweep, and I've told you twice, right? And then the third one is that one there, you know. But basically, that was my problem is, I couldn't say no. So I, I've had to learn all these things, because I didn't understand that what I was seeking was in here, and not out there, you see. And I think that's where we can help. We can help kids to realise that the power, that the true empowerment is, is within them already, you know. And it's, it's what the scriptures have been saying for a long time, that... If you're looking for this solution, it's in here. Yeah. How are we doing? Okay, five minutes or so. Um, so that's the heart thing. And that's basically what happens. The central nervous system collects all information, sensory information, tries to make sense of it, goes to the hippocampus, tries to pick up associations, stuff like that. Then from there... The parasympathetic and the sympathetic nerves go to the sinoatrial node on the heart, and that sends information to the heart. We can consciously intervene in our breathing, and we can consciously change our emotion. They're the two things that we can use to change the way our heart works. If we change the vibration of the heart and the frequency that it sends back to the head, that changes brain waves, gives us the ability to either think less clearly or think more clearly. Does that make sense? Well, I hope you've got something from this. Just to say... It doesn't work unless you work it. You know, you might have heard that before. But, you know, lots of people do have theories about this, like I did myself. And most of my theories were, that will not work for me until I was guided to try these things, you know. And I swear to you, uh, I nearly took my own life because all my gaze was out there. I was, I was tied up in expectations and looking outwards. And I really honestly mean that I think you get to a point in your life we just have to start looking inwards and things start to change, you know. So I hope you've enjoyed that and um, it's been a pleasure to see you all and thanks very much. Thank